um, and I'm very happy to be here, my first visit to Malta. And you may not be aware, but uh, in addition to the conference here, the, the actual real reason for Peter assembling um, all of us, the speakers, is uh, for us to get together and um, interrogate each other, see where our expertise overlaps, and how we might all come together in a multi-site international collaboration uh, trying to improve the health and well-being of uh, people with Down syndrome. So thank you, Peter, for having us all here. We're going to change gears a bit now. Um, I'm a biochemist, and I'm going. my talk will really be uh, introducing uh, what we do, but also be a segue into Dr. Obid's talk and to Dr. Tycho's talk following her. And you probably get some overlap, but actually you'll probably um, need it, so that'll work out just fine. So my talk's going to be all about the kids, and these are the happy faces of these children with Down syndrome. And as you are well aware, um, they will be mentally retarded. Uh, many of these children are at high risk for leukemia, uh, for autoimmune disease, frequent infections, and as they get, get older, um, the amyloid protein is on 21, and uh, they are at risk for Alzheimer's. And these are the parents who uh, are devoted to these children, and I'm thrilled we have parents here today. Um, and I did want to acknowledge this very special parent, Peter, and introduce his son, David. Um, Peter, I, I, I refer to Peter as indefatigable, relentless. This man has spent decades trying to do exactly what we're doing here, bring people together to try to better the research, to better the lives of people with Down syndrome. And I think we really ought to acknowledge <laughs> Peter for his life work, honestly. And as you know, trisomy 21 is the third copy of chromosome 21. So this is how our lab looks at uh, trisomy 21, the three copies of genes that are overexpressed. And we're particularly interested in, if I can get this to work, um, we're particularly interested in SOD1, and I'm happy to see we have an expert in SOD1 here. Um, and, and it's on a chromosome 21 and overexpressed and may influence the vulnerability to oxidative stress. We're also interested in cystothionine beta synthase, um, which is a gene on our pathway that uh, may be involved with epigenetic dysregulation, and I'll be explaining that, so don't, you're not familiar, uh, I will get to that. Uh, the amyloid protein is also on 21 and may contribute to oxidative stress. And then there's a gene called DNA methyltransferase 3L that's in, uh, actually a, a cofactor type uh, methyltransferase that's important uh, for de novo, uh, a different uh, DNA methyltransferase 3A that also may affect epigenetic dysregulation. And we're going to be uh, focusing on DNA methylation, uh, which is one of the several mechanisms of um, epigenetic dysregulation. So these are the two genes that uh, our lab are particularly interested in. So I want to review for you a paper we uh, published in the American Society of Human Genetics a few years ago. Um, but before we talk about homocysteine metabolism, um, I think it's important that uh, we walk, that I walk you through the steps of homocysteine metabolism. And I think if you follow this, uh, and just follow the logic, follow the flow here, um, when we get to the data and the next talks, um, I think it'll have more meaning if you can put it in this uh, metabolic context. So there are basically three um, cycles um, that are interconnected. The folate cycle leads into the second cycle, uh, methylation or methionine cycle or transmethylation, and that leads down to what's called transsulfuration, which is a synthesis of glutathione, and these pathways are all connected. So let me just walk you through. Um, pathway one is actually connected with, uh, the folate cycle is connected with the methionine cycle through this enzyme, methionine synthase. And methionine synthase takes the methyl group from folate 
transferring it through B12 to homocysteine to create methionine. So now methionine is activated to S-adenosyl methionine, and SAM is the major methyl donor for a multitude of essential methylation reactions, and these include DNA methylation, RNA, protein, phospholipid methylation, coming from this methyl group from folate and being distributed through to cellular methylation. Then once it gives up its methyl group, it becomes SAH, or S-adenosyl homocysteine, which then is, oops, going forward here, which, I think I'll just use this one, um, sorry, uh, which is then uh, converted back to broken down homocysteine, and the cycle is present in every cell of the body, and, and again, essential for, um, backing up here, I'm sorry, getting ahead of myself. Okay, um, and it's essential to sort of recycle methionine, which is an essential amino acid for protein synthesis, but also for these essential methylation reactions. Uh, about half of the homocysteine uh, leaves the cycle and is converted down to cysteine, and cysteine is the rate-limiting amino acid for glutathione synthesis. And GSH is the active uh, antioxidant detoxification mechanism, and GSSG is the oxidized inactive form. So when we talk about epigenetics, we're really talking about it's related to DNA methylation through this methyl donor coming again from folate. That methyl donor translates and, and, uh, to the methyl group to DNA, uh, and that is going to be our connection with epigenetics, and I'll explain it further in just a moment. The connection with oxidative stress is down at the bottom of the pathway where uh, the glutathione is synthesized, and when that ratio of the active to the oxidized form is low, we relate to that as oxidative stress. And then, actually, there's also a, a connection with genomic instability because the folate uh, provides one carbon groups for the synthesis of the nucleotides that make up DNA, and when these cycles are out of balance and these pools are out of balance, that can lead to error-prone DNA synthesis. So what happens now in, in uh, Down syndrome? When we have an overexpression of um, CBS, which is right here, and SOD, which is down here affecting the glutathione. So let me again just follow the flow here. When we have an overexpression of CBS, what happens is that it's pulling homocysteine down this cycle more than normal because uh, the activity is elevated. That reduces the homocysteine level but increases the products and the cysteine, and we see that in um, the children with Down syndrome. When there's less homocysteine, the enzyme activity, methionine synthase, doesn't have the precursor, so the activity is reduced, and that will cause a buildup of the other precursor, the 5-methylfolate. The we call that a folate trap. It's just not going anywhere because it's not being pulled into uh, the reaction, and that is referred to as a functional folate deficiency. Then, again, a problem with methionine synthase um, activity is going to decrease the uh, folate available for the nucleotides, and that can relate to the uh, genomic instability. And then on the other half, a decrease in this enzyme activity will decrease the products here and uh, increase, we see a decrease in SAM and increase in SAH, which again is the uh, SAM being the donor for the methyl groups on DNA. Uh, can affect the methylation and the epigenetic expression. And now, down here with the superoxide dismutase being overexpressed, there's an elevation in the production of H2O2, which is going to stress the glutathione ratio, reducing its ability to act as an antioxidant or detoxification, and again, so that's the relationship of our biochemistry to these endpoints that we've been uh, referring to. And you'll probably hear it again in the, in the next uh, slide. So if you didn't get it first time, <laughs> we have another chance. All right, so this is our paper. Um, now that you have a little introduction, uh, I'll show you the data. So we had 42 children with confirmed trisomy 21 and 36 uh, normal siblings. And 
these parents were incredible for us because it's very hard to get a control child uh, to stick out their arm. But the parent, but siblings actually are an okay control for trisomy 21. And these parents would come in with the normal siblings and we were able to get um, 36 normal siblings. Uh, and then we measured our metabolites in the pathway and we also looked at um, lymphocyte, uh, what we call global or genome-wide methylation. And here are our results. So as we would have expected, and these are, this is the U.S. sample, the Down syndrome children had a, a lowering of homocysteine, that CBS uh, pulling homocysteine down that pathway. And again, uh, we saw a significant decrease in the methionine, the product of the methionine synthase, <coughs> as if it was not being uh, synthesized as well in the children with Down syndrome. And then at the bottom half, cystothionine, the product of CBS, was significantly increased, cysteine was elevated, and we saw a decrease in glutathione, consistent with an elevation or overexpression of the SOD. So if we look at, at DNA methylation then, um, SAM levels were decreased, uh, adenosine, which is a product that can be involved with um, inhibition of methylation, uh, was increased, and DNA methylation uh, was interestingly hypermethylated. In this, um, in this uh, assay, the lower counts actually reflect hypermethylation, and again, this is in uh, lymphocytes. So then we uh, cultured, we had, we obtained uh, cell lines from trisomy 21 uh, individuals, and we thought, well, if we added exogenous um, metabolites uh, to, our, um, to our cells, could we change our uh, metabolic profile? And yes, we did. Uh, that was very interesting. And we added folinic acid. Again, we were able to change uh, ex just in cell culture, adding just adding the uh, folinic acid. Well, that led us then to well, th th we'd like to try to see if we can do the same thing in real children in real lymphocytes. Um, and so this was our uh, pilot study, uh, definitely a pilot study, but it was encouraging, as you'll see. So we wanted to know whether if we added folinic acid and betaine whether we could increase their plasma levels of homocysteine methionine and their glutathione levels. Um, so we compared them before and after. We supplemented with 500 milligrams of betaine and 400 milligrams of folinic acid for three months. And I will show you that data. I want to describe what betaine is if you're not familiar, and I'll show you. It's actually an alternate route uh, to get to methionine, independent of methionine synthase. Uh, so our goal here was, can we get the methionine up? And if we can get the methionine up, will that normalize uh, their downstream products? And we added, uh, we chose folinic acid, uh, which is a stable form of folic acid, and it can be uh, readily converted to uh, the DNA synthesis and can participate in uh, the methionine synthesis as well. And let me show you how that works. So here's how, this is, this is the pathway we were just talking about where we get the folate trap and the functional folate deficiency because homocysteine is low. Well, there's this other pathway that um, in the liver that will convert homocysteine to methionine independently, but it's um, dependent on betaine. And this is betaine homocysteine methyltransferase. So our thought was if we add betaine, can we then increase the methionine and normalize uh, the pathway and increase levels of homocysteine so it's available then for the methionine synthase. And the folinic acid we thought would be good to, to, uh, to support the other half of the um, folate cycle and uh, possibly then also be able to contribute to normalizing um, these, these metabolites in the kids. So let me show you those results. And again, this is only with 13 children, but it was encouraging and we'd love to be able to um, do this in a larger uh, blinded study. This was a blinded study as well. So what we saw, interestingly, we were able uh, with the folinic and the betaine for three months 
to significantly increase their methionine levels, which is our major goal. And I was happy to see the SAH levels come down because SAH is a product inhibitor of the methyltransferase. And um, that we would want to normalize, so we would open up uh, the epigenetic possibilities that methyltransferases would be less inhibited. So we were able to normalize um, their methionine metabolism. And then if we look at the bottom half of our um, pathway, we were successful in both the total and free glutathione were increased after um, the GSSG, thankfully, was decreased, and of course, the ratio was increased. So again, very preliminary pilot study, but encouraging. We, we were able to do it in the cells, and then we looked in the children, and um, it's, it's well known that this cycle is very responsive to diet, and that's what I'm going to be uh, emphasizing for uh, the rest of the talk. And then I wanted to uh, show you our preliminary results that uh, Dr. Tycho had sent us um, post-mortem brain uh, from adults with uh, Down syndrome uh, and had us look at our markers of oxidative stress and epigenetics. So this is kind of a prelude to, to his talk. So if you're not familiar with epigenetics, I like to call it where the genes meet the environment. It's very much influenced by the genetic background, but also by the environment. And epigenetics is basically how um, genes are turned on and turned off in the face of a static genome. Uh, and we're going to look at DNA methylation, and uh, we haven't looked at histones, but that's another uh, major mechanism of epigenetics. A good way to look at it is if the DNA sequence is the hard drive, then the epigenetics is the software that tells the DNA when and where and how to turn on genes. It's how cells know who they are, how they remember uh, that they're a liver, and they, all the liver genes are turned on, but all the other genes, what they are capable and have available, are turned off by methylation. So it's critical for tissue-specific gene expression. So the genes as are basically static. Um, it's the DNA sequence that you, were, that you inherited from your parents. But what's exciting is that epigenetics and the environment are something we can modify. And can we do this in kids with, uh, with Down syndrome? And again, my emphasis is diet as an environmental factor that could improve their vulnerability to oxidative stress and possibly normalize their um, abnormal DNA methylation and epigenetics. And this is a slide to remind us we are affected by what we eat. And here's a kind of a conveyor belt with the food being digested in the folic acid and the betaine, and it's broken down by enzymes, and there we've got the methionine, and there's our SAM with the methyl group. And here's the DNA methyltransferase transferring that methyl group to DNA. So it does depend on the availability of these nutrients to support um, methylation. And this is just a quick way to give you an idea of how genes are turned on and turned off by uh, methylation. Uh, histone acetylation, we're not going to talk to, to you today. But basically, the bottom line is that when genes are less methylated, it turns out they're more acetylated, the DNA becomes more relaxed and open and allows the transcription factors space to get in. This is primarily in promoter regions of genes. So less methyl groups, hypomethylated, genes are generally turned on. When there's more methyl groups, hypermethylated, those genes are turned off because it's, the DNA conformation becomes much more compact and basically less accept, accessible to the transcription factors. So basically, that's, that's how genes are turned on and turned off, very generally. And then I, I thought this, this was a review that came out very recently uh, talking about the epigenetic landscape in intellectual disability. And I want to read you the last line. Um, this is a group from Spain that's highly respected. Down syndrome is not an exception. And the most recent report suggests that epigenetic 
epigenetic factors may play a crucial role in its etiology and may also have the potential to provide new panels of biomarkers and tailored, bio, tailored treatments, which was right along our lines. So here are the results of looking in um, Dr. Tycho's postmortem brain samples. He sent us uh, purified, well, the, he also sent us T cells and then from the brain, uh, neurons and separated glia cells. And we looked at 8 oxydeoxyguanine. This is a biomarker of oxidative DNA damage. And we're finding an increase, significant increase in the lymphocytes as well as in the brain cells, which is quite interesting because we're seeing uh, actually no, no, we have not looked at, uh, so we're seeing it in the periphery, but we're also seeing it in the brain, which, which is interesting in that maybe peripheral cells could be uh, valid surrogates for the brain, in, at least in terms of oxidative damage. And then we looked at 5% 5-methylcytosine. This is when we talk about DNA methylation, we're really talking about uh, percent methylated cytosine in DNA. And we, and we measure this with mass spec. So again, looking at T cells and neurons and glia, um, this is generally, and again, I, I have to be general here because it gets very complicated, but generally hypermethylation hyper is associated with decreased gene expression. So again, in T cells in the periphery, we're seeing uh, globally a decrease, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, an increase in percent 5-methylcytosine and also in neurons, uh, but not in the glia. So we're seeing in the periphery and in the brain evidence of uh, global hypermethylation. And then this um, is a very new uh, epigenetic uh, marker for, called 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, and it is generally a bi biomarker of increased gene expression. And we need to pursue this further because, as you'll hear from Dr. Tycho, he's seeing both increase and decrease in gene expression in uh, the, post, the Down's postmortem brain. And so we're seeing, uh, again, this increase in this marker in T cells, neurons, and not significant, but increase in glia as well. So we need to pursue this. This is uh, a very interesting new marker, possibly of uh, a way to finally understand uh, DNA demethylation. This may be a a step in the demethylation of DNA. Okay, so these two mice are very, very interesting. These mice, these agouti mice, are genetically identical, like identical twins. The only difference in these mice is the methylation of this agouti gene. And the reason they came out differently is that the mothers were fed supplements of folate, B12, betaine, and choline are the nutrients we're very interested in. And here is, the, so the yellow mouse is obese, prone to cancer and diabetes, and the agouti gene is hypomethylated, but the ones that were supplemented came out, the, the, the progeny came out healthy, thin, and they've shown that that agouti gene was methylated, and this is diet. The only difference is diet. And here's another example. What about bees? Bee epigenetics. The queen and the worker bees are genetically identical. But the queen is fed the special royal jelly, which alters the DNA methylation uh, of genes uh, that allow her body to develop into a queen, whereas the worker food alters the methylation, changes the expression, and this bee with identical genetics becomes a worker bee. Again, I'm trying to make the point about diet changing epigenetics. And it's not just, this, this actually is just impressed this month, uh, is also true in humans. Uh, this was a natural experiment, which is always a fun thing to do. Um, there's no feeding for a certain amount of time. This is what these women eat in Gambia. Um, it changes uh, with the season. In the wet season, 
they get higher intakes of folate, B12, B6, choline, and betaine. Uh, and in the dry season, six months later, they don't. And so they measured these, our metabolites, over the season and found that, yes, just naturally, they bounce around according to the diet. Which brings us to this topic of nutrigenomics and how genes and nutrition can affect uh, disease and uh, it's best known for cancer. And this potential natural experiment in Balta, Malta that may relate to the Mediterranean diet, which is very, very different from the diet that we have in the uh, United States. So there's been a lot of studies looking at the health benefits of the Mediterranean diet. I mean, it really is effective in terms of heart health, immune health, weight loss, reduced cancer risk, cognitive gain, and increased lifespan. Exactly what we would love to have for these kids and improved quality of life. And this is what uh, the Mediterranean diet basically uh, involves daily intake of olive oil, cheese, yogurt, lots of fruits and vegetables and whole grains, weekly intake of fish, poultry, sweets, and low intake of red meat, wine in moderation, physical activity, and, and uh, lots of water. This does not look like a U.S. diet. There have been reviews uh, looking at the potential ben benefits of adhering to this type of diet, as simple as it sounds, on cognitive health. This study was done in Chicago, uh, in our country, in older adults. And there, there is a, a scoring system uh, uh, that, will, uh, that will score the adherence or non-adherence to this Mediterranean-type diet. And what they found was that the adherence to the diet was associated with slower rates of cognitive decline. And again, as Ilana was speaking, it, early intervention has got to be the key. We've got to get there before it happens. And there's been a lot of studies looking at the effect of diet or supplements in individuals who are already have Alzheimer's or demented. And it didn't work. So you know, the take-home message is it doesn't work. No, you have to get in early. And that's where diet is, I think, uh, an underappreciated uh, critical possibility to uh, affect health and cognitive decline. Um, here's another paper, um, Annals of Neurology. They, they conclude that a higher adherence to a Mediterranean diet was associated with a decreased risk of Alzheimer's. This was early on. And another paper suggesting that oxidative damage may be one of the earliest events in the onset and progression of Alzheimer's disease. And again, of course, these kids are prone to uh, Alzheimer's disease. So we're thinking, you know, this may be in Malta. Of course, it's not perfect, but we can score the families that are more adherent or less adherent. And they're certainly going to be more adherent than what we see in our country. Um, Americans do not in any way meet federal uh, requirements. Uh, this, this paper, uh, this was based on, we, had, we do a national survey of what Americans eat, and they concluded that the, most Americans that consume a diet that does not meet dietary recommendations. Another ra rather disturbing piece of, uh, to the disturbing picture uh, emerging of a nation in diet crisis. Uh, journal of Nutrition is a primo uh, nutrition journal in the United States. Again, the conclusion uh, that Americans have way high energy intake, marginal micronutrient intake, poor compliance uh, with dietary guidelines, and low concentrations of vitamins and minerals. So that led us to think about, well, what could we do comparing um, children with Down syndrome in Malta with children in Down syndrome in the <coughs> United States. And we have already met yesterday, and we're going to meet again this afternoon uh, to discuss possibilities, what we, what we could do together for the kids now um, to improve their immune function, to, immune, to, to improve their quality of life based on the expertise that we have 
in this room. And I think we do have the ability to look at their uh, background genetics, we can, we can probe their diet, their epigenetic alterations, and look to see what could contribute to the spectrum of abilities that we see in uh, children with Down syndrome. And I, I think this just occurred to me as I was putting the, the, the talk together. Uh, again, I study autism primarily, and clearly there is an autism spectrum. But in fact, there's also a Down syndrome spectrum. Some kids function better than other kids. And I don't think uh, that's ever been looked at. And in terms of the expertise we have, it might be interesting to look at their epigenetics, look at their biochemistry of the high functioning kids compared to the ones that are more severely affected and see if we see any difference. And if we do see, again, with our pathway, we know we can fix it with diet and, if necessary, um, supplements as well. So that was one of the things we were talking about yesterday. Um, so we might hypothesize then that a more Mediterranean-style diet could, we might see a better, uh, the folate pathway, the glutathione antioxidant potential, and the epigenetic pattern. And we'd like to see whether that might be associated with imp improved immune function compared to children who uh, live on chicken McNuggets and french fries in our family, in our country. So these were just some topics and some ideas uh, that are just, we will be discussing more tomorrow, uh, but I thought you might be interested in kind of getting an idea of things we are talking about. One possibility would be, again, to see whether adherence or non-adherence does alter immune function and epigenetics. Um, and again, it might be very interesting to see if we see differences with high-functioning kids compared to low-functioning kids. And then once we have that sort of data, and I think our first phase for our plan, or, or at least what we're coming to, is that we need to develop a repository in Malta, in the U.S., possibly in Germany, and maybe in Italy. Um, where we can see where we are in terms of the epigenetics, in terms of the biochemistry and the immune function, and see if we can um, come up then, once we, ha once we see what we have, uh, and very, uh, we need to characterize these kids medically, their background, have samples from mom, dad, sibs, uh, plasma, DNA, RNA, once we have all that and we can do what we do with it, then we would be able to imagine how could we intervene to improve their immune function, to improve what we see in these kids. So here were just two titles that, that I'll just end with this that um, I came up with and we will be discussing. And I, again, it's, it's kind of like a natural experiment. It's not like... Um, like in Gambia, I mean, I, I, I'm assuming, I, found, I just learned yesterday that McDonald's has been introduced to Malta, which blew my complete, my complete theory, but surely you eat more olives than we do in our country. So again, it's a natural experiment, um, and it's lifelong. Uh, we would hypothesize then that the adherence to this Mediterranean-style diet would be associated with reduced markers and improved of oxidative stress, improved immune function, and possibly delayed cognitive decline. And we would like to hypothesize that uh, the metabolic and epigenetic profiles of individuals in Malta consuming this more Mediterranean-style diet would be different from the U.S. And then once we determine who's who and whether we see that, that sort of differences, then we could talk about dietary counseling and targeted supplements to simulate the diet and could we improve these profiles, their immune function, uh, epigenetic patterns, and prevent de delay uh, cognitive decline. Um, that's going to be a hard one uh, because that has to be long term, but there is uh, a, a test for um, adaptive function that we might be able to use to see to, to, to establish the high functioning from the low functioning and whether there's any diet connection. And then again, uh, defining uh, these same biomarkers, 
are high functioning different from low functioning? So we would uh, hypothesize then that the high functioning uh, individuals with Down syndrome would look better in terms of their uh, oxidative stress markers and damage and their epigenetic profiles compared to low functioning. And then again, once we determine that, then we can think about intervention trials to try to simulate uh, the high functioning uh, pattern that we see. And I think I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention.